has to be the Holy Spirit. You get nowhere unless the Holy Spirit is moving. That's why I like to use oil. When I saw this little 15-month-old baby last night, I asked the parents, may I anoint her with oil? And the mother looked a little startled. You would be too if you weren't used to that. I said it represents the power of the Holy Spirit. Oil represents the Spirit. She said, fine. And so I put a little dab on the child. And the child had been fussing. And as soon as we put that oil on that child, laid hands upon it, it settled right down. And it's much assurance. You have the assurance that God has promised you. Healing and miracles and deliverance. And you also know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. The person who's ministering has to be a person of integrity. Not sinless, but you need to have your act together with the Lord. You need to have a good reputation. You can't be walking into that room just dripping with sin and self. And not only that, but you've got to have the kind of reputation that somebody wants to follow. Verse 6, you became followers of us and of the Lord. We are human beings who need to follow. We need to imitate. Little children imitate their parents. I don't have time to teach my kids, you might say. Don't worry about it. You're teaching them anyway. Teaching them bad examples or good examples. Uh, I learned something from the uh, Dog Whisperer. Do you ever watch Caesar Milan, the Dog Whisperer? He taught me something which I've used to great advantage, and that is his power of the pack. If you'll notice when he gets a really, really bad dog, he takes that dog out of the house and into his pack of about 50 dogs in downtown, wherever he is, L.A. or someplace, and he puts that dog among the others, and that dog begins to learn from the others. And I'll tell you, teaching is going on all the time. With these four dogs, there's teaching, and they're following each other, and they're correcting each other, and I have a pretty easy job. I open the can of food, I open the car door, and other than that, I don't do much. I just go out and take a walk, they follow me, as I said. They correct each other. If one of them starts to have fear, the large male German Shepherd gets afraid and nervous, those little terriers get in his face and they growl and they start to get in the business and they start to go after him. The little 23-pound fizz is going after a 110-pound Sammy. I said, back off, kid. Just back off. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know what you're doing. But they'll, uh, they'll, they'll follow and you and I are to be examples. People are going to follow us in the Lord. And the people are watching you. They want to see your faith. They want to see it operate. And they will follow you so long as you follow the Lord. Well, that's good. You're saved and you're receptive, but you've got to also bear fruit. And uh, you can be saved and you can get to heaven, but uh, you're not going to have much in the way of rewards if you don't go out and do anything for the Lord. So there's an old saying, watch out for the triple S's. You know, <laughs> as you're saved, you are going to sit, soak, and sour. You don't get out and really serve the Lord. You just sit and you soak in yourself and then you sour. Um, you need to get out and you need to minister. Verse 7, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. They became examples to others of how to live in Christian conduct. Macedonia was the northern part of Greece and Achaia was the southern part. And they were examples to all. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. Isn't that wonderful? Mm -hmm. So your example has been followed by others. And what is their example? From you, the word of the Lord has sounded forth. Their example was sharing God's word and then living God's word. That's what caught on. That's where the power is. If you and I are going to serve God, we're going to have to share His Word and share His Word with our actions as well. And He says, your faith toward God has gone out. We don't need to say anything. No need to correct you. Isn't that a marvelous feeling when God says you're doing just fine? No need to correct. Just continue what you're doing. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. 
So they declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you. Other people know that as we came to you, you were receptive. You gave us proper entry, and you showed your fruit through your faith toward God, and that faith has spread, it has gone out, you don't need to say anything, and they themselves declare concerning us that entry, verse 9, and how you turned from God, or to God, from idols to serve the living and true God. You guys were totally caught up in gods. Did you ever study the Athenian and the different Grecian gods and goddesses, or the Roman gods and goddesses? They're often the same, just different names. Oh, they had a God for everything. And that's why in many cases they didn't uh, mind if Paul came to Athens and talked about another God. It didn't bother them a bit. Uh, Pilate wouldn't have been concerned about Jesus claiming to be God. Back when he was trying him in uh, Palestine, it didn't bother them at all. Another God? Hey, so you're a God? <laughs> Enjoy it. Uh, so they turned from those gods to the living God, the living and true God, the only God. We think about our salvation and our past, and we uh, probably didn't bow down and worship some statue. That's not very prevalent in our society. But think about a god with a small g or an idol as anything which takes the place of the living and true God. Now that begins to open up the definition quite broadly, doesn't it? That really means anything which takes the place of God, any person, any place, anything, anything that keeps us from serving God totally. And of course the God of self may be the biggest competitor. The God of the small g of ourselves keeps us from serving the living and true God. So all of us have to turn from our idols to serve the living and true God as they did. And once you turn from the idols to God, you then wait for his son from heaven. You're turning to God in order to wait for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, whom God raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. What is the wrath to come? What is he delivering us from? Well, we know in the near future about the tribulation. And Revelation tells us in chapter 6 that this revelation uh, of this experience of the tribulation is not going to be for the saints, largely because of this verse, God delivers us from the wrath to come. And Revelation chapter 6 tells us exactly who is the author of the wrath of the tribulation. Verse 17 of Revelation 6. For the great day of his, referring to Jesus, the great day of his wrath has come, and who was able to stand? The tribulation is Jesus' wrath being poured out on a Christ-rejecting world. He will not allow his people to go through the tribulation. He delivers them from that wrath to come. Now that's the near-term fulfillment. The far term is after the Tribulation comes the millennium, the thousand-year reign of peace, and then comes the white throne judgment for unbelievers and all who go to the white throne judgment who have not been believers through all ages will be cast into the lake of fire where they'll be burned and be tormented and be forever and ever in that state. And that is the ultimate wrath to come. It is Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Well, that's the Thessalonians' testimony. And now we hear the testimony about Paul's conduct as he tells us that while their conduct was evidenced by salvation, receptivity, and fruit, his conduct is seen in boldness, love, and diligence. Once you're saved and once you're serving, your conduct should be one of boldness, one of love, and one of diligence. Verse 1 of chapter 2. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, 
but God who tests our hearts. Paul, like all believers who are functioning for the Lord in proper Christian conduct, had boldness. Verse 1 again, You know, brethren, our coming to you was not in vain, it was not a waste of time, but even after we suffered before, being spitefully treated at Philippi, remember that, how they were beaten by the uh, jailer? <coughs> Silas and Paul were there, and they were beaten in the night as they sang and praised God at midnight. And God answered by opening up the uh, prison doors miraculously. Well, we had a tough time there at Philippi, but instead of cowering, instead of hiding, we came to you, and we had that same boldness with you. And they, of course, stirred up problems in Thessalonica, and they had to keep on moving down the pike. But they were always bold, they never gave up. And you and I must not give up either. Sometimes there'll be resistance, sometimes there'll be problems, but you need to be bold in the Lord. Scripture tells us that the righteous are bold as a lion. Verse 3, our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. As they were exhorted by Paul, he didn't do it erroneously. He didn't do it in an unclean fashion. It might have been unclean if it was not sincere, if it was deceptive, if he had a motive in his mind, like maybe trying to fleece them, then it would be wrong. But he was without uh, deceit. He was open, he was honest, he was clean. And that's the important thing for us in ministry, is to live clean and to serve clean, no matter what the situation. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. We need to be approved by God. God needs to save us, he needs to elect us, he needs to approve us, and then he entrusts us with the gospel, and as he does so, we need to have that boldness, because we're approved by him. If you're a salesman, and you're going to try to sell a product to a certain customer, and you are trying to sell a product that has been approved by some association or a governing body, you have confidence in your product, don't you? But if it's some slipshod thing made in a faraway country with no approval at all, you're a little bit shy about trying to recommend this product. <laughs> but we have a gospel to share which has been approved by God himself. So therefore, we ought to be bold. And he says we are not pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. When you try to please man, you're going to have trouble. You spend too much time on the horizontal plane trying to please people in marriages, in relationships, in business and what have you. If we'd spend more time in the vertical trying to please God, his word says that when a man's ways please the Lord, he causes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Now we ought to be decent and kind and considerate and serve and love other people, but you've got to put God first and ask him to show you how to do it. Otherwise, we're just wasting time trying to appease people and we'll never make them happy. Well, we're not trying to please men, we're trying to please God. And God is the one who tests and knows our hearts. So we need to make sure he finds them clean and pure. Well, that's his boldness. Now, he's also a, one, a man of love, verse 5 through 8. This is important for Christian conduct to be loving. For neither at any time did we use flattering words. <coughs> 